Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, your fourth full length album came out in 2018, uh, Illusion of Love. Yeah. And you did all the touring, the things that come along with putting out an album. And then you took some time, I think. Or did you start, as soon as that felt, cycle felt finished, mm -hmm. were you were you writing? Did you have an idea for the next record? Or did you take some time? I guess like similar process that I have with most of the records where I'm collecting ideas over time. Um, just like voice memos on the phone, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and I had a bunch of those after a certain point. And um, usually when I've collected enough, I walk around, listen to them, and see if there's something that I feel is really there. Uh, and then when I have a, like 15 to 20 of those ideas, I, I kind of narrow it down and then start picking ones to focus on more carefully. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I usually start playing those ideas more often and then slowly writing melodies and, and, and lyrics that come, come to mind. Yeah. Do you stay organized with your voice memos? I get bogged Not down. Not really. I and, like. Yeah. I'll make a star next to it if it mm. if I like it, Smart. and then name it more specifically if it's a particular chord progression that I think has a certain feel or a, a sound that like. No, but it's not. Like I I, I I very rarely even back them up. So they like now they go on iCloud I think. But yeah, for a while it was just like oh I hope they're there and I'm sure there's many that I've lost over time, and then I'm sometimes taking like field recordings as well so it's all kind of a mess <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so then when do you know that you have an album that it's time to book time and and an album is happening usually when I have this about 15 songs completed mm -hmm. so I, I want to go in like considering that the album is going to be 10 to 12 usually for me like based on the song length and that's usually the sweet spot where I like to be able to cut a few mm -hmm. and that was actually the case with the with the illusion of love I had many more you know we went in and we did 18 or something right. like that and it was obviously going to be too long to play it all at once mm -hmm. uh, so it broke into an EP and and a tw and then a uh, record right. was it 11 12, 12 songs yeah. um, so same same thing with this I wanted to have about I, I actually wanted to go in with less this time so that I didn't have uh, well it was a lower budget too and just did not want to have decisions to make in that way mm -hmm. so um, I think I had 14 or 15 and when they're, when they're beginning to end complete with lyrics and the melodies are tight and I feel like I'm playing them well is another thing mm. so that I don't so I'm not searching as I go in to the studio of like what is the song and you know then develop it with you guys and flush it out right um, sonically but the idea should be complete was there anything different about the writing process this time on this one yeah um, I mean it was different because of COVID and being home and stuck in, in place I mean I actually went out to LA because uh, my friend's apartment was free and in the new year I often get in a kind of a January slump and I wanted to go and get some work done so I flew out to LA in January and I was there for 10 days and I got a leg up and started writing a few mm. um, I'm trying to forget now which ones I wrote out there I wrote Hard to Say the Meaning out there mm. and like things like that started to gel um, lyrically and um, and then after that, I came back and I wanted to continue that flow. And I didn't have a studio in the city at the time, so I rented a house in the Catskills. Mm -hmm. um, and I was doing that. And um, when I, finally, when that was winding down, I came back to the city. And then the, I didn't have, really have a plan after that. And then COVID struck, and then, uh, and then I went up to the, to the family home in the Adirondacks right. with my wife and the dog. So we were trying to find privacy within that in the winter time and it's like you spend a lot of time indoors and um, so uh, yeah so that that process was different in that we were really stuck in that one place for a long time and um, so I was out writing lyric if I was writing lyrics I could sometimes take a long walk and work on it that way which is part of the process yep. and then uh, she would give me a room 
you know, and go out for a long walk herself so that I could have the house and make some noise and try to figure out what I was doing. Yeah. Um, so that was that. And then, so that was different because I usually, moving around is usually part of the process for me where I, I like to be in different places and then take the songs to different places so that I can have fresh ideas. And if I'm stuck and I'm missing a verse somewhere or whatever, sometimes changing my geography will help. Right. So that was a bit of a challenge, but in other ways it was good because I was able to f maybe focus a little bit more than I would have otherwise. Mm. There were no other plans or distractions. Right. Did you give any thought when COVID hit and was, it was clear we were going to be locked down for a while, did you give any thought to just taking a break and, and putting things on hold? In terms of writing? Well, in terms of making the album too, because we made it in September, yeah. kind of in the middle of, of things. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I uh, wanted to roll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had the songs ready and at that point, and I just, it felt like a total wasted opportunity to have basically time be frozen and, and not get something out of it. Right. So um, making the record felt really key. And then I also knew that while well, my wife was pregnant, we had a baby on the way, and I didn't want those things to overlap. So I, I quite carefully planned uh, when the album needs to be done and, and all that so that I wasn't doing these two momentous things at once. Right. Uh, and it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> There's like some challenges here. I want to talk about, you mentioned openness. Yeah. I remember very specifically, maybe the first rehearsal we ever had uh, in 2012, which was for Stray Ashes stuff um songs and um i think we were at anthony lamarca's apartment the yeah. first time and i remember playing you always keep around and i didn't i had heard the song i knew basically what i was supposed to be doing but i didn't know it all that well and i remember a point where you were like the bass drum goes right here and the tambourine goes right here and it was it was a, a moment for me to realize oh he knows every note which I should have already known because you, right. you played it all and you made it by yourself <laughs> yeah but it, it was it was a jarring thing to to realize that you were hearing what I was doing and that you knew exactly where everything was supposed to be right and not that you were uh, uh, too forceful about it or that I felt like I you were being a dictator about it or anything, but I, it, was, uh, it was interesting, and it just feels like, I guess it's also establishing trust, like we talked about with Dan, and, and establishing more of an openness over time. Mm -hmm. I feel like we still collaborate, for me, on drum parts. I love being able to, to bounce ideas and hear your input and try things and come to a, a place, but it, mm -hmm. it definitely feels especially with this record, I think because we had less time to rehearse, mm -hmm. that, that there is more of an openness to trust me mm -hmm. and probably everyone involved to, to do their thing. Yeah, well, I, I find that w as you do something more and you get better at it, um, you also n know better how to choose people and have an intuition about who you're choosing to do stuff with. Mm -hmm. And with you and I, for instance, we've been collaborating so long that I know that you have good things to contribute um, and that I should just give you room to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the same was true with Logan, like I wanted to play with Logan because he's great and, I, and, he's, and he does really inventive stuff that I could never think of or that I could never think to ask him to do. Right. Um, so I think it's that if you just choose, if you choose the people that you think are right for it and you give them more room, you're bound to get a better result and you can always shape it a little bit and it doesn't take that much. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a growth since that first time we were playing together. I mean, that, that album was actually a good example of how controlling it was because I made it mostly alone. Uh, I had some art parts added later um, that I felt were missing or that I couldn't contribute well enough. But I wanted to try to make something entirely alone because I didn't know anybody at the time that, that was the right person to contribute. Right. Um, yeah. And maybe having done it all yourself it allowed you to to recognize what you were gonna want from other people it allowed yes, that yeah. openness to yeah to you know your it. limitations and mm -hmm. if you're playing everything and uh, you hear where you're limited and where 
where the, your, your signature performance is actually worth something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like there's a level of, I don't know if it's understatement, but this record feels a little more intimate in mm. several ways. Mm-hmm. I think for me, there's lyrically, which I'm sure we'll get into, but even, even sonically, um, there aren't any big rockers like in the sand or mm. six and five. And, and I think even just, I think of, of making records with Dan and, and him being very hi-fi and creating a real, there's a real sonic landscape mm. almost on each instrument. And this one feels a little more focused. You mentioned the, the kind of 70s rumors drum sounds I feel like the drums are a little tighter Mm. and every instrument is really carrying its weight um, if that makes sense rather than fitting into this broader um, sonic uh, landscape do Mm. you do you feel that way or was that a a conscious choice or is that how it just worked out for these songs you mean in the sense that it's a different landscape that is not quite as um, well? I guess in terms of the rockers, um, that that's just a pr- preference. Like where I'm, the types of songs that I end up writing, I, I don't really have any control over. Mm-hmm. So um, when I was writing those more more aggressive and more urgent songs, mm-hmm. um, some of those I was writing in studio space that I had and I was playing a lot with louder guitar and it was mm-hmm. just the mood that I was in to mm-hmm. um, make more noise and to, I guess it was to release whatever angst I was feeling. Mm-hmm. And, in, and these songs ended up being a bit quieter um, and more more like more like ballads. Um, uh, and in terms of the soundscape, I wanted to leave a, lo- a, little, a little more air and, and do have the arrangements be a bit more simple. Mm-hmm. Um, which they didn't end up necessarily being more simple, they just ended up being more sparse. Right. And um, yeah, I think that was just refreshing to me at, at what, the time that I made it. Just not adding things for the sake of it, you know, like Dan and I would add some things to a song, um, see what it, how it added, and just like, well, what happens if we just take it away? And then you're listening to it without anything, and it's, sometimes it's hard to decide, but we just made that decision a few times. We're just like, yeah, just leave it out. Mm-hmm. Just leave it out and just leave it kind of vacant. It leaves room for vocal performance to mm-hmm. take over mm-hmm. lyrics. Uh, I think that's what I, <clears throat> I think that's what I mean by intimate, direct. Uh, kind of a the message is in is in the vocal delivery and yeah. in the lyrics, and that's really a prominent thing. It it really feels like we got to a place where the music was truly supportive of, of the song mm. for this. Um, have, you, have you made any kind of conscious effort to change your focus in or change, hone your vocal delivery as you've gone on? Was there any? I guess it hasn't been a conscious thing, but I noticed it when I listened back that the, there's a bit more dancing in the vocal performance. Um, and that just gotten a little bit better at singing over time, and I think that's just from playing live a lot. And I never practice singing, and I, I'm not. I prefer to not be too aware of it, um, which means that you know at times I've lacked control in that way. <laughs> and like, um, but I, I've gotten better with that uh, over time. And you know, there's a lot of words on in, in this in the on this album, and um, so. Yeah, it was never, it's never deliberate with figuring out how to sing the stuff. It's just how, how it was going over time, like practicing them and playing the songs. It just came out, came out that way. Yeah. Is there, when you're recording the vocals, mm-hmm. I'm never around for that. Um, is there a lot of back and forth with Dan or you... you uh, About the performance? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll ask him for his feedback, you know, like it, just if he's buying it. You know, uh-huh. uh, usually I feel that myself. If you, you know, if you get in, you know how it is. If you're in your head, or sometimes you're having a great take, feels good, and you don't have to do many. And sometimes it takes a little while because there's the pressure. It's kind of like doing a thing like this. There's pressure. You feel like you want to get it right, and, that, and then there's the characters that can come into your head. I don't um, feel any pressure. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, it's uh -huh. you know how that stuff is. It's mm -hmm. like, and that's what that, that's the kind of thing that you're telling yourself when you're doing the takes. Mm -hmm. And it's unnatural singing with headphones mm -hmm. on, and, and the music's no longer moving through you. You're not playing. That's the other thing for me. While playing and singing is important, and I'm you know when we're when we're cutting the final vocals, I'm usually not playing something. So that is it's hard to get that feeling. Um, so he's good at telling me, you know, if he thinks it's where it, where it should be. And then, and I'm usually, when I listen to it, I know, you know, yeah. sometimes I come back and I hear it and I think, oh, I don't, wasn't, I wasn't, it, I, I don't know, I just don't like what I'm, whoever it is that's coming back at me, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> just uh -huh. like I don't relate to it. <laughs> um, so it's kind of just going on gut with that stuff. Have you ever done it while playing guitar or found that you, you needed to for any particular performance? A few songs where, um, like on with I Never Knew, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I actually that was actually from the demo, and I performed that one live. Mm -hmm. And we tried recutting it, um, or I think actually we didn't try recutting it, but we just decided not to because in the past um, that happened actually with the last record with All These Kids I Never Knew, I had to cut the demo, and um, I recorded it kind of simplistically with a single mic on mm -hmm. the piano, and we tried to redo it. We had a really nice piano, um, and tried to redo it separately and cut it a little more sleek, and it didn't work. I just I didn't like the performance, yeah. and it just it wasn't good, so we used the, the demo version. Yeah. So some of those songs now I know when they're really delicate and it's just going to be a sparse instrumentation. Sometimes the feeling comes across better if it's just done live, played together, and um, then you're just dealing with what you're dealing with sonically. But if the mood is right, you can kind of give and take with that stuff. When did you realize that Antelope Running should be the title? Um, I guess with the... Uh, uh, it makes me laugh because remember we were, I remember joking about the animal names and stuff. And I, when I brought it up to, uh, to Jen and to uh, a couple friends, they were like, "Yeah, I don't know, dude. The animal, like, we're done with the animals, and you know, <laughs> tired of animals." And I said, "Well, it's not, an, it's not the band name. It's the title, you know." Right. Um, I just couldn't get away from it, and I, I, I that song to me felt like the most. Um, it's one of the songs on the record that I'm most proud of, but it also embodies the themes to me uh, m most completely. Mm -hmm. And the moment of that lyric in the song um, also had a specific meaning to me personally, and so I just couldn't get away from it. And it's, it's short and sweet, and I don't know. I just, I liked it. I liked it, and uh, for, for the symbolism of it, and how I related to it, and I don't know if I could say much more that would be meaningful, but yeah, I just liked it. <laughs> it's great. Even as you're saying that, I'm realizing how much that embodies uh, the, the, the process for me, yeah. too, because it's one of the, as we said, kind of it, the storytelling kind of song feels very intimate, kind of the, the story of it, like you're watching You Have a Day, Mm. Um, just from close by, uh, very specifically. Yeah. Also, it's a, it's a longer song. It, it seems to tie into that openness that we were talking about, that it's very live, the, the performance mm -hmm. of it, um, and it really takes its time. Feels feels very confident to me that, mm. that uh, it's not... It's, it, it takes its time developing, and we, mm -hmm. all, we all felt like we played pretty freely yeah on it um and sonically on that song that's a different you used a prophet yeah and that's a new thing you got that before, yeah it was yeah. actually a gift um chris bought that for me and and it's something i had been wanting for a while because it we, on the other records we used the prelude a lot mm -hmm. and i love the sound of that it's a string the string synth mm -hmm. and it sounds beautiful and but it's it's limited and you know it you can't get a lot of that it's a string synth, so it's it's it, it's not. You, it has those specific tones, mm -hmm. and it, like flute tones, string tones, brass, um, and the prophet. What I liked um, 
with the with the Rev Two is you can actually you can save the sounds because it has a digital interface, but it's still running analog mm -hmm. circuitry. Um, and so, actually, but I wrote that song on the piano, and um, we tr I remember we were trying it in rehearsal with the piano, mm -hmm. and it just started to feel too similar to other songs that I had had already, mm. um, arpeggiating things like. Reminders Defeats has that pattern and Sister Eye and I just wanted to have a different soundscape. Mm -hmm. I got a little tired of that thing and um, I just thought, I so I, I remember that morning I was spending a lot of time getting the right sound because yeah. it's it plays through the whole song. And if you don't have the right sound, you get so tired of it <laughs> by the end after eight minutes or whatever, however long that song is. So I wanted to, I wanted to get it right. Um, and that felt like a comfortable sound, and we, we tweaked it a little bit afterwards to um, further just b blend it in so that it's just kind of, we wanted it to feel like it's almost subliminal by the end right. of it. Right. Uh, and then the piano, we ended up adding in the end, so mm -hmm. it, it, we did get that girth from it also. You mentioned Chris Abbott. Mm -hmm. He directed the video for Go Lightly. Yeah. Uh, how did that? How did that come about? It was his his idea to use the still images and yeah, tell yeah. The it was entire, entirely his idea. Mm. Um, Chris has been, been a friend for a really long time. We lived together for years, and um, he's been a, a big supporter of my art and and uh, vice versa. Like have a mutual respect for each other's work, and so he was he. I gave him the copy of the, uh, of the record early on, and he had been listening to it a lot. And he wanted to try directing something because he we'd collaborated in other ways where he was acting in the videos and um, he's been on shoots helping and, and doing things and so he wanted to direct something and um, yeah so we were working with it was you know we, we couldn't have a big crew uh, mm -hmm. it was hard to do things with with COVID still at that time mm -hmm. and he was coming up to visit at the house often and uh, so he came up with that idea. And so he bought, my wife's a photographer, he borrowed her camera, so the G, Contax G2 is a film camera. Mm -hmm. And we just shot many roles, and um, yeah, that was all his idea. And then our, his, our friend Matt Hannum, uh, who's a really great editor, helped to kind of with the pacing of it. And um, yeah, we shot it all, uh, it was in February and it was raining, and it was just like, a, <laughs> it was just very weird weather. Uh -huh. um, but it was, you know, we hung out while we did it, and it was, it was a fun experience. I, I noticed in just with the still images, mm. it's not something I'd really thought about before. I had seen things, not, not exactly like that, certainly, but things that use still images, and it just struck me with this video that there's kind of a whole world in each little one, even though it's passing by very quickly. Mm -hmm. felt very different from if it was a, a video of you moving through be mm -hmm. because of the it somehow brought the scenery more into focus for me somehow mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. because each each image is its own little story rather yeah, than yeah. seeing a continuous story um which uh yeah I, it's a cool idea yeah i i didn't even know if it was going to work and i i was <laughs> i was skeptical of it you know at first when he was talking about it um it, it worked out very well in the end it's beautiful. Yeah. And the other, uh, well, you've you put out multiple videos, but um, Brady, your friend. Yeah, Brady Corbet. Brady Corbet uh, did a video for The Stream Rushes On. Yeah. Talk so about he that. shot that. He surprised me with that one. Um, we had talked about doing another video because he did one for Sister Eye on the last record. Mm -hmm. And uh, we collaborated on that and went down to Kentucky. Um, and uh, yeah, we've found the skywriter we hired this guy to do write this very specific thing <laughs> and it was like it was a pretty big endeavor and um for this one he was in norway uh with his with his with his wife and kid and they were they had been out there throughout the whole pandemic and um so he just shot this with uh with his brother-in-law and um and then he had acquired that that other um footage from the coast guard and uh, so he put that together and sent it to me, basically done. Wow. So it was, again, like kind of trying to work remotely and um, doing the best that we could. 
and uh, it ended up quite a nice compliment to the first video because it has that aviation yeah. tie-in yeah and um, yeah I love it that song also um, it's it's pretty sparse in the yeah. arrangement kind of what we were talking about before you really zero in on the on the vocal performance but also sonically feels feels different what um, there's only like three aspects of mm -hmm. you have the the drums that Dan programmed yeah delayed and then which keyboard is that that's is also that, the synth profit the yeah and and your vocal performance mm -hmm. and what else that's it that's it. just those yeah. three things yeah. and then at the end we layered the profit on, on came in the high register and the low mm -hmm. just to create a bit of a crescendo mm -hmm. um, but yeah that was just uh, the, the the simple way that we wanted to do it and that also we added other stuff or talked about adding other things but it just felt like such a nice world to be in and if the listener was patient enough it, it felt like you could be rewarded um, there were times I remember in the recording when I was listening to it and I thought like I don't know I, I was it was losing me and I, I, I felt like something needed to happen mm. um, but I don't know it's it's um, yeah, it was again one of those things where it just it felt be better to leave it alone. So, you know, I guess listeners have to decide if they get bored or not. And you know, <laughs> it, it, I, I think it works. Yes. Um, and and so you know that's how we left it. I agree. It works. I, that's interesting to think. Sometimes you have to resist that that impulse. Sometimes mm -hmm. you just know that something else has to come in, and sometimes you have to think twice about whether whether you need to keep piling stuff on yeah in that minimalist approach it, it, you, you add something if it's absolutely necessary mm -hmm. um, and that was kind we weren't working in an extreme kind of regimented way around that but uh, it, it, ended, it ended up being the philosophy of sorts but some songs are maximalist like <clears throat> Challenger has a lot of parts and layers mm -hmm. and there's tons of layers of synth and guitar on that and um, yeah that just it just felt better to pile stuff onto that one, mm -hmm. and um, and then move you know move things around and you know who played those toms behind my back after I left on that song? Uh, that was that was Dan. <laughs> I, I ended up playing um, high like roto tom style on uh, or like not roto toms, but they were they were these little hand drums. But I played them with sticks, uh, and they're faint. <laughs> they were louder in the mix at first, and they're in the choruses of an accident. Oh, oh, right, yes. But it ends up having like a, too, a little bit too much of a cha-cha, uh -huh. so we blended them down and then it was fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, yeah. That's nice. Some funny drum, drum uh -huh. stuff. I, I mean, I'm completely kidding. That's exactly, that Tom stuff is exactly what Challenger needed. And the yeah. minute I heard it, it was like...